Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the Quokim series. So uh, I'm really excited for today's uh, lineup of distinguished speakers, uh, starting with Professor Stuart Russell, uh, the uh, Professor of Computer Science and the uh, Smith Zede Pref, uh, Professor in Engineering here at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so it would take too long for me to list his uh, qualifications and awards and contributions, though I will include the book that he co-authored with uh, Peter Norvig, uh, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, which is now being used by, uh, by universities in the uh, quadruple digits in countries in the triple digits um, across the world. And, and also, um, Stuart has been a powerful uh, influence on the field of artificial intelligence, starting to take seriously uh, the positive and negative effects of future advances in artificial intelligence on the world and the things that we care about. In that respect, he's been talking to uh, influential groups, uh, major conferences, as well as the Davos World Economic Forum recently. And so we're very pleased to have him here today to talk to us about the, uh, the prospects for work, uh, reorienting the field on provably beneficial um, artificial intelligence. And, um, and also, Miri has been pleased to have him as a research advisor, helping direct us in, um, in what things are important for us to work on. So, uh, so I would like you to all please join me in welcoming our very first speaker, Professor Stuart Russell. Thank you very much, Pat. So um, uh, I made a last minute decision to switch to a much shorter talk. Uh, and that will give us hopefully much more time for discussion. Um, so I'm going to dis dispense with the usual preliminaries uh, of this where I talk about you know, what is AI and what's happening now and look at all this amazing progress and all these milestones and so on and just say, look, let's take it as a given for the sake of argument that um, eventually we will exceed human capabilities in some still not very clearly specified sense, uh, you know, partly because we don't really know what human capabilities are. Um, but if we think about what it means to make decisions and how to make better decisions, it means if you can take into account more information, uh, if you have a better model of how the world works and you can compute uh, more extensively on that model uh, and look further, further into the future, so sort of think of this as like AlphaGo moved from the Go board to the whole world, um, then AI systems are gonna make better decisions than humans. And I put an asterisk here, so an asterisk is something that linguists use to mean this is, this is not quite a felicitous expression in the natural language. Um, and so what, what, what could I possibly mean by putting an asterisk on better? Well, there's a piece missing, not just taking into account more information and looking further into the future, but what is the objective that's being optimized uh, in making the decision? That, that turns out to be a crucial point. So. Um, so the upside, as, as Nate mentioned, is, uh, is, is pretty large because pretty much everything we have is the result of our being intelligent. Uh, and so if we had more uh, intelligence at our disposal uh, to use as, tool, as tools, um, we could do all kinds of, of wonderful things. And you know, the, each of these areas is something that, that have, they've been problematic for the human race forever, pretty much. Uh, and the last one, ecological degradation, is, is getting much worse. Um, and it seems like, well, it couldn't hurt to have access to more intelligence uh, to help. And you can even imagine very concrete ways where it might be very useful. Um, you know, so one of the biggest issues when you look at poverty and disease and war is actually, I mean, it's, it's not that we don't know what to do about these. It's actually that we have, we have difficulty in, in management of collective decision-making and implementation processes that AI can clearly help with. Um, sort of, if you like, uh, global distributed government governance uh, at a sort of a micro level where you know, lots and lots of people have to do lots and lots of things for this to work well. Um, uh, so in the long run, we could get away from the constant you know, fight with ourselves and fight with necessity in sort of physics uh, and actually choose how we want uh, human life to be. So that would possibly be very good, um, or not. I mean, there's another, at, least, at least we have a choice whether we 
know how to make that choice. That's another question, uh, but, but at least it'd be nice to have a choice. Uh, and then the downside, well, everyone knows about killer robots and everyone knows about the end of employment. Uh, and then there's this other thing, the end of the human race, which seems to be a very popular theme these days. Uh, but I would say most of the discussion about this theme has, uh, at least in the media and you know, when I meet people, when I go around giving these talks, uh, everyone seems to, or almost everyone seems to have got hold of the wrong end of the stick. You know, many wrong ends of the stick. Um, but there is a sort of a general sense, and this, has been, this goes back to um, certainly to Alan Turing uh, saying that, uh, you know, I expect at best that they will keep us as pets or something worse to that effect. Um, that if you make something that's much smarter than you are, then uh, you, we might sort of find ourselves in the situation of the gorilla. So here they are having a meeting. And this guy is falling asleep. You can tell it's a meeting. Uh, <laughs> and um, they're talking about whether it was a good idea for their ancestors to have created this human race, these, these human things, which are much smarter than they are. Uh, they're having a really hard time with this, this issue. And I think they pretty much concluded that it was a terrible idea, uh, because now they don't have any control over their own futures, and they could easily go extinct. Uh, and it's, uh, if, they, if they had the ability to conceptualize their own state, they'd probably be very sad about it. Um, but that's a very inchoate fear. Uh, and then that gets translated in the media into all kinds of things, like, oh, you know, armies of killer robots are going to spontaneously rise up and, uh, and decide that they hate human beings and so on and so forth. Right? So you know, you know all of the, you know, Hollywood sometimes gets it almost right and mostly gets it mostly wrong. Um, so more specifically, right, the problem is, um, is this, right? That, that they're going to be incredibly good at making decisions and doing stuff, um, but somehow it isn't the right stuff. I mean, if they are incredibly good at making decisions, then it's the right stuff, right? They really are helping us realize whatever it is we decide we want to realize. How, you know, that's, that's, that would be what we want. So it must be because they're not quite doing that. They're doing something else. They are obje the objective that they are uh, making decisions on is not the right one. Um, and unfortunately, AI, by and large, and these other areas, operations, research, control theory, and so on, all assume that, that specifying the objective is actually not part of the problem at all. Right? It's just uh, you know, the user who knows what it is. And uh, you know, in, in control theory, it's like you know, squared error with respect to the reference trajectory. Why it's squared error? Well, because that makes the equations easier. Um, but it doesn't have much connection to actually what anything anyone really cares about. Um, so, uh, so actually, there isn't a lot of help. right? When you say, OK, we have better, we've got to get these objectives right, otherwise we're screwed. Uh, OK, what discipline can I turn to? Uh, the answer is not really. There isn't a place to turn. And um, so Norbert Wiener pointed this out. So this is a very useful paper. I don't know if you have a reading list, Nate, for, for the group, but there's a, uh, there's, uh, there's a nice paper. Um, I often point journalists to this paper. So he wrote it in um, Science, I think, in 1960. And it was in co uh, as a result of looking at Arthur Samuel's checker playing program that learned to be better at playing checkers than, than Arthur Samuel was. So it was a very early demonstration uh, refuting the usual uh, claim that, oh, you know, machines can only do what we program them to do, so we don't need to worry, right? Um, and uh, so he said, okay, if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere, we better be quite sure that the purpose uh, is the purpose we really desire. Um, and that, that's a pretty clear statement of the problem uh, from 56 years ago. But arguably, that, that statement could have been written by King Midas uh, whenever. Is there some uncertainty about the date? Uh, sorry? His pen would have turned it down. Had he tried to write it down? Yeah, in the paper as well. Um, so, uh, so this is a, right, so the story of King Midas is actually 
both in microcosm and macrocosm, uh, a lesson for humanity, right? So the, the, whoever it was who was granting King Midas's wish took his objective literally, and, and then it was too late, right? Once his food and his wine and his daughter all turned to gold, he couldn't undo those things. Um, and he said, damn, you know, I wish I had said it right. And this is often, you know, in these stories, in other cultures, you know, there's a genie, and the genie grants you wishes. And, you know, this is in, in uh, going back to the time of King Solomon, and in the Jewish culture, and in uh, Arab cultures, and lots of others, there's a version of this story where you ask for wishes, you get what you want, and then, you know, your last wish is, please undo the first two wishes, because I got them wrong, All right? Um, and then in the macrocosm, right, this is actually telling the human race, well, perhaps what, you, what we are wishing for, right, the ability to automate and have sort of super control over everything uh, in its sort of unlimited powers may actually be a, a poison chalice for the human race in general, not just for the individual. Um, so we better be more careful uh, about our macro policy. Um, and so Steve Omohundro, uh, pointed out some uh, some additional problems. So not just that when you have a machine with the wrong objective, right? In some sense, you're you're setting up a, a chess match or a go match between the human race and the machine that's busy pursuing the objective that's wrong. Uh, and we know what happens with those matches. So, um, but Steve pointed out that it's actually worse than that um, because uh, if you give a goal to a machine. Um, then even if you don't ever mention to the machine that uh, it should preserve its own existence. So, I mean, Asimov didn't need to have the third law saying that machines should preserve, avoid harm to themselves, because it's actually unnecessary. Um, right? They will nonetheless form this as a sub-goal, because you, uh, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead, so you give the machine the goal of fetching the coffee, the machine figures out, based on physics, that if it's dead, it can't get the coffee. So it naturally has a sub-goal not to be dead, right? as a consequence of needing to get the coffee. Uh, this is a very straightforward point. And also, you know, it can improve for sort of typical goals in the real world. You improve your chances of success by having more resources, more computational resources, more money, and so on. So all other things being equal, you're going to want to acquire more of those. Um, so then if you have a machine that has the wrong objective and is going to have these things as sub-goals, then you can clearly see that uh, you're going to have how like problems. Um, so that's the high-level story, and it's a, it's a pretty straightforward story. Um, and then there have been a number of arguments about why, nonetheless, um, we should pay no attention to this issue. Uh, so, so I thought it would be helpful to go through some of those, uh, and we can discuss them further uh, after the end. But um, you will come across these. You probably have come across many of them already. Uh, so one of the first responses, I'm sorry, this color is not ideal for, for the lighting situation. Um, actually, could we, maybe we could turn the light. Is there any other light on purpose? Yeah, we thought they were low enough, but... Uh, in fact, it wasn't low enough, given that I chose the wrong color. Okay, it's supposed to be orange. Okay, yeah, so one, all right, so orange is, these are things that other people say, right? Uh, so t one typical response is, it's never gonna happen, right? Or, you know, we're, we're not going to achieve human level AI, and so it's pointless to, to worry about this, or it's, it's so far off in the future that it's, it's completely ridiculous. And, you know, if, if, I think if it was true, that if you went to people back a million years ago, you know, uh, who figured out how to make fire, actually pre-humans, um, and told them that this fire stuff was going to cause global warming and they should stop, <laughs> right? I think that was probably like that would be not good advice. Um, so if it, you know if AI was going to happen, you know, a million years in the future then yeah, probably it's too soon to, to even uh, think about what we might do. Um, but I wanted, you know, so, I, so in response to that, I sometimes point to a historical example. This is 
Ernest Rutherford, who was the most famous nuclear physicist of his time, so, so not a weird fringe dude, but actually the main guy in nuclear physics. Um, and here's what he said on September 11th, 1933, uh, essentially that uh, it will never be possible to, to get energy out of atoms. Right? They knew that the energy was in there based on they had done the mass defect calculation. They knew the equals mc squared. They knew the amount of energy that was there. But his considered view, which he expressed in many ways, in many forms, and many times, was that it was impossible to ever get it out. Uh, and even Einstein kind of agreed with this. Um, and then, so that was September 11th, he, he said this at a, a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and it was reported in the Times, and Leo Zillard read this in the Times the next morning, and he got annoyed, and so he invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. Uh, and within a few months, he patented an uh, early version of the nuclear reactor, you know, with uh, negative feedback control mechanisms to, to damp out the critical reaction. Um, Soon after that, people were patenting nuclear bombs and, and so on and so forth. So it went from never to 16 hours. Uh, and so it's very hard to predict these things. And I, I think just saying, well, I'm an expert and it's never going to happen is not a good enough argument. Um, and this is what he wrote. So after he did it, he did a demonstration of a natural fission reaction uh, and he said, you know, there was little doubt in my mind that the world was headed for grief because at that point they were also in an arms race with Germany and he anticipated that there would be nuclear conflict with Germany. Um, okay, so a version, another version of that is it's too soon to worry about it. Um, you know, if you, if you ask many people, you know, when do you think it's likely to happen? You know, I generally try to avoid giving predictions because, precisely because of the, the nuclear physics example. Um, I mean, I think it, requ so it requires breakthroughs, but it's very hard to say when those are going to happen. Um, but if you ask people you know, in the field or near the field, they'll say, you know, give you some number that looks like 50 to 75 years, some people earlier, but not that many people think it's not going to happen this century. Right? So, so if I said um, that you know, in 50 years' time, a giant asteroid is, is on course to collide with the Earth, you know, would we say, oh, it's way too far away to, uh, to even worry about it or even start thinking about the problem? You know, so come back in 58 years, well, sorry, 48 years, and we'll, we'll, then, we'll, then we'll give you some funding to work on it. Uh, that wouldn't be the kind of response one would expect. And, and arguably, for climate change, the right time to intervene would have been around 1900, when we already knew the basic physics. You know, Arrhenius and others had published papers you know, giving quantitative calculations of greenhouse effect uh, and projecting carbon dioxide. Uh, and you know, influential people like Alexander Graham Bell had said, you know, this is going to be a major problem. We have to do something. Um, but it was ignored. I don't know exactly. I haven't looked at the history of why people didn't pay attention at that time. But that would have been a time when you could have intervened before the fossil fuel uh, industry and electrical, electrical power production became so important uh, to our entire economy that, that it's very hard to change. Uh, you know, so you could have started investing in wind power and solar power, and, uh, improved battery technology and, and other kinds of things uh, a long time ago, but we didn't. Um, so my distinguished colleague Andrew Ng has another version of this story, right? It's, it's like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. He's, since changed that to Alpha Centauri to make it, <laughs> to make it seem even more ridiculous, or, or, or perhaps he thought Mars, well, that perhaps it is reasonable to worry about over on Mars. I don't know. <laughs> Having seen the Martian, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, this is, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an appealing analogy, but I think it's to totally misleading. Um, you know, another version of this, which I saw in a paper recently, was uh, you know, it's like worrying about black holes suddenly materializing in Earth orbit. I mean, yeah, if they did, that would be terrible, but it's just, you know, there's no particular reason to think it's going to happen, so it's sort of silly to worry about it, right? And the answer to both is, so they're saying, well, you know, if we were spending billions of dollars to move the human race to Mars without thinking about what we would breathe when we got there, right, that would be, that would be silly, right? I mean, 
You know, similarly, if we were spending billions of dollars to cause black holes to materialize in <laughs> near Earth orbit, then it would be reasonable to ask, you know, is that a good idea? And you know, have you thought about the consequences? Uh, how would we would prevent the obvious sequelae? And, you know, so, so I don't find uh, Andrew Ng's so argument. For making black holes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I mean, if you're going to use the argument that it's, well, this is yeah. just like materializing, you know, worrying about materializing black holes, they'd say, no, it isn't just like that. And so, um, yeah, so I mean, so in other words, the onus is on someone who says that to, to actually prove that in fact AI is harmless, that it isn't a black hole, because we are spending billions of dollars to make it happen. Right. Um, another, another version of this is, well, if, it, if the problem comes with uh, giving objectives, like make some paper clips or whatever to the, uh, to the AI system, then it's better not to have us giving the goals to the AI system. Just let the machine invent its own objectives, um, which is a little odd, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of like saying, you know, if you have a problem steering straight, then the best thing to do is remove the steering wheel altogether uh, and just leave it up to chance, as it were, to, uh, to make the right thing happen. Um, this, is, this is something that you see a lot. Um, IBM, for example, this is their general, uh, their general view of why we don't have to worry. Well, because we're going to have these beneficial human AI teaming. Uh, and so it's not going to be you know, machines independently operating and deciding what to do. There's going to be human AI teams that work together. But you, know, you can't have a human AI team unless the team members all are aligned in what their objectives are. So it's just a restatement of the problem. I mean, yes, of course, we want beneficial human AI teaming, but that is, in fact, begging the question, how do you ensure that the AI part of the team is actually on the team? Um, another uh, common response is, well, okay, you're right. Yeah, it's a real issue, but there's nothing we can do about it whatsoever, right? Because it's well known that you can't control research. You know, there's no way to put a stopper on human creativity, uh, you know, and then usually people will show cute movies of, of kids playing, you know, interacting with robots in exhibitions and you know, look at this, you know, outpouring of human creativity and there's no way you can do anything about this. Uh, and there's, you know, there's some validity to that, but it's not really true, right? We can and do. Uh, biologists deliberately said engineering the human genome is not something we want to do. And that was a complete switch because a, an awful lot of work on genetics and, and early molecular uh, biology was precisely about the ability to, to improve humans. And then it was decided, oh, perhaps that isn't an ideal goal for biology because that opens up a Pandora's box of uh, you know, genetic elites and all the rest of the stuff that science fiction has already looked at. Uh, so they said, no, and it's been 40 years, and it still hasn't happened. Uh, although it's, it's been reopened uh, recently with this, this uh, CRISPR technology, um, although the inventors of CRISPR also believe that we shouldn't use it to, uh, to engineer better humans. Um, another interesting reaction is this is just typical Luddite, right? You're just attacking AI, you're attacking technology. Um, so, in fact, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and various other people, I guess everyone who signed the open letter on uh, robust and beneficial AI was included as winners of the 2015 Luddite of the Year Award um, from the Information Technology Innovation Foundation, who, who seemed to be vehemently uh, opposed to any, any of these thoughts. Um, and I just think this is misdirected uh, because it's just misunderstanding what we're saying completely, right? If a fusion researcher says fusion researchers need to be contained in order to be safe, right, that doesn't make them a Luddite. It's just a complete misunderstanding of what's going on, right? They're not attacking physics by saying that. Uh, we're not attacking AI. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say that Turing was attacking AI, 
uh, by pointing out this long-term issue, or that we know is attacking AI, uh, or Bill Gates is attacking AI, right? I mean, these, these are people who put a lot of their effort into, into creating AI in the first place. Um, so um, another reaction that you often see, even from very distinguished AI researchers, is, well, this, there isn't really a risk, right? Because if anything we don't like, we, imme we immediately just switch off the machine, and that solves the problem, right? As if super intelligent entities couldn't possibly think of that, uh, that eventuality and wouldn't, you know. So it's sort of like saying, yeah, you know, if you're, if you're losing a game against AlphaGo, well, you just, you just win, <laughs> right? What's the problem, <laughs> you know? You just win, very easy. Um, you know, some people say, well, if we, could, if we just avoid anthropomorphizing and putting in these goals like self-preservation, then of course, there won't be a problem. Steven Pinker's version of this is if we just make female AIs, they won't want to take over the world. I mean, literally, he said this. Uh, and so, you know, you know this, it's just these stupid male AI researchers who don't get it. Um, you know, but you can't not put it in. I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't put it in. It will, it will arise anyway because you can't get the coffee if you're dead. So, um, and I'm happy to discuss any of these further. Or you may have heard other arguments uh, that you, you're not sure how to respond to. Um, so the proposal is that, in fact, uh, you know, the part of the problem is that AI is traditionally conceived, for which I, I guess I have some guilt in purveying this idea that, that AI is about rational behavior, which means optimizing objectives, um, you know, allows for the pos you know, at least doesn't think about the issue of, well, what if the objective isn't the one that you actually want to have optimized? Uh, so could we change AI to a different field? Initially, initially we're going to call it provably beneficial AI, and you can see why there are asterisks, because this is almost oxy oxymoronic because uh, beneficial is so vague and touchy-feely and provably doesn't seem to fit with that. Um, eventually, it'll just be called AI because, you know, just like we don't, you know, if you're a civil engineer, you don't say, oh, I work on bridges that don't fall down, right? You just say, I work, I, I work on bridges, right? It's just, sort of just intrinsic to bridge design that they don't fall down, and it should be intrinsic to AI system design that they're supposed to be beneficial to you. Um, and that's sort of what it means to do AI. So eventually this will just be called AI, but for the time being, we have to distinguish it from traditional AI. Uh, okay, and how do you do that? Um, so, so here's one way, and there are, there are others. You know, there, there's a whole range of research that can be done on, in some sense, trying to constrain behaviors of AI systems, which is I'm not gonna talk about, but. That's a, a completely plausible and interesting, and, but as yet totally unsolved direction. Um, but if we want to think about this, this question of, of how do we get rid of the problem of, of misaligned values, well, you could say, well, the only way to get rid of misaligned values is to, is to get the values to be exactly the same, right? to get the objectives to be exactly those of the human race, and then everything's fine. And that's, but that's too difficult, and it also isn't quite necessary, right? What needs to happen, actually, so this is no, number two is crucial. Number one is just to point out in some sense that Asimov's laws are, are one, at least one of them is superfluous. We don't want the robot to care about itself at all. Right? It has no intrinsic objectives whatsoever. Its only objective is to optimize human values, but it doesn't know what they are. Right? And so this is a, if you like, a. So this then get, you get soft alignment, right? That it's at least compatible with humans because it's uncertain about what the human objective is, and it's the, as we say in probability, the support of its distribution uh, includes whatever the true human value function might be, um, even though the machine isn't sure which which of the possible value functions is right. Uh, and this turns out to be quite. Helpful, and then the third part of this is well, okay, how? Yeah, we could have a very a robot that's very, very, very uncertain. Right? It doesn't know if humans 
like losing legs or like gaining extra legs or just like having the number of legs they have, right? Well, that's not a very helpful robot, right? Because now the robot says, I'm really not sure what to do to help you. Um, okay, so you, would, you want it to uh, get better at understanding human values so it can be more helpful to you. And uh, the information source is there, right? The raw data, if you like the ground truth, is contained in human behavior because that reveals information about human preferences. So those three simple ideas you can put together in various ways and get uh, and start to make progress. So, um, so a version of the self-preservation thesis from Amahandro is is this one, right? To have a uh, a robot that you know and it has an off switch, so someone can come along and just press the off switch, and now the robot's dead, right? Um, and uh, you know, if you take Omohamur's argument literally, what he says is, look, if the robot has the objective of getting the coffee, you know, one way of failing is that someone comes along and presses the off switch. So if the robot has an action which permanently disables the off switch, uh, so it's sort of an internal off-off switch, then, uh, then it would naturally do that, right? There's no cost, uh, and it, it gets rid of one branch of the tree that would lead to failure, and so it's clearly a good idea. Right, um, and when you put it like that, it's sort of hard to find, even think of a way around it. Uh, in fact, when you put that into mathematics, there is no way around it. It's in fact, you know, unavoidable. And um, so, but if you um, if you avoid giving the robot a precise objective, but instead you allow it to be uncertain about the objective. So, for example, it might know that it's supposed to get coffee, but it's uncertain about what other you know, what the signs of the uh, other variables in the value function might be, you know, so is it allowed to, you know, kill people who get in the way of the coffee machine? It's not sure, All right? Well, so then it starts to, its behavior will be different because of that uncertainty uh, in the value function. And in fact, um, so then you've got uncertainty about the, the human objective, and, and then you have to have some attribution of rationality to humans. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, but it has to be, you know, human behavior has to be sort of correlated with, uh, with their objectives. Um, and so roughly speaking, then the, uh, the, you can think of the human action of switching off the robot as actually providing information to the robot about what the human's true value function is. In particular, you know, whatever the robot was about to do is not helping. Right? And so that's why we are switching off. And so the robot should be happy to be switched off because that leads to an outcome that is more beneficial from the, for the human than uh, the robot disabling the off switch. Okay, and so and you can, when you do the math, it works out, and in fact, the, the margin of safety is proportional to the allowed, amount of uncertainty about the human value function. And, uh, but of course, the more uncertainty there is about the human value function, the less helpful the robot can be. Um, and that seems to be an unavoidable trade-off. Okay, so um, yeah, so then the consequence is it's actually in the robot's interest to to leave the off switch uh, available. Um, so then let me talk a little bit about this third point: value alignment. Uh, you know, how do we learn what the value function is? How we, how we narrow down this uncertainty from observing behavior? So there's this old field called inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, it has other versions, um, so in, in economics and applied, you know, consumer theory, they do something called preference elicitation. Uh, you know, so Sony presents consumers with, you know, 81 different versions of headphones and asks them to, to, uh, to say how much they pay for them or which ones they like better and so on and so forth to f try and figure out the human value function for headphones. And, uh, you know, so that's a sort of, those are non-sequential decision problems, like you know, do you want this one or that one? Um, but there's another field called uh, structural estimation of MDPs, um, where, uh, for example, you know, the economists look at uh, when do people have children, and then somehow you figure out the value of children from, from people's sequential child production behavior and things like that. Um, so. Uh, the general idea is that the behavior is a, is a very complex manifestation, uh, which is made complex actually by the environment in which the behavior is produced. 
Um, but underlying it, there's a simple explanation, uh, which is that the human wants some things, I mean, cares about some stuff, and uh, and so that's a, if you like, the physics of behavior. All right, what is the underlying law of physics? Is that the humans want things and they act to try to get them, and so you can invert the behavior to figure out what it is they want. And this is this has been around in AI since '98 and. There are quite effective algorithms that are quite scalable, and people have uh, done, there are several hundred papers on how to do this. Uh, it's not quite the right problem. For one obvious reason is that um, you don't want the robot to adopt the value function of the human. Right? That's, that's trivial but important. So if, if the robot watches me struggling out of bed and wandering downstairs like a zombie to get my coffee, uh, it can figure out that, oh, you know, Stuart really likes to have coffee when he wakes up. Um, but you don't want the robot to want coffee. That doesn't help, right? So, so it's not adopting the value function. That's usually how it's done in inverse reinforcement learning. You, know, you, you observe a helicopter pilot, and now you learn uh, about desirable helicopter maneuvers, and then the robot does them. So it actually adopts the value function. Uh, so, the framework we developed is a, a generalization of that called cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, which is a game theoretic um, setting. And you could essentially you have a human or multiple humans and a robot or multiple robots. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the human has a value function, and at least implicitly they know it, or they might not be able to make it explicit. The robot know, doesn't know it and knows it doesn't know it, uh, but it's, that's its objective to maximize. And, and then when you when you solve this game, when you look at the solutions of the game, they automatically produce the kinds of things that you want. Namely, you know, the robot uh, is cautious, it asks questions, the human actually has an incentive to teach the robot so that, because the faster the robot figures out what the human wants, the more it can be helpful. Uh, and you know, we can actually show, um, show little examples. And so this actually contradicts the inverse reinforcement learning assumption. Right, the inverse reinforcement learning assumption is that the human is acting optimally according to some value function, and then we observe the behavior and we try to figure out what, uh, what the value function is. But actually, in this setting, the human doesn't act the same way as they would if the robot wasn't there. Right? They sort of will you know, demonstrate things. They'll even you know, point out what not to do. Right? Whereas a human by themselves would never do that because it's totally pointless. Right? And so you actually get different solutions. And, and, and so since the human is going to behave, as it were, non-optimally, at least in the isolated sense, then the, the algorithms for learning from that behavior also have to be different. So the standard IRL learning algorithms won't work in this setting, and they have to be revised. So it, it creates a, a much richer, more complicated, and interesting setting. So here's just a very trivial example that Dylan, uh, my student Dylan hadfield Manel. He's not, Dylan's not here right now. Um, so he just did this, it's a, it, so it's sort of deliberately trivial, but you have a grid world, and um, uh, there are three locations that can be of, uh, th sort of three centroids of value, and they can have different, you know, the, any of these could be positive or negative, and then they would uh, radiate that value to their neighboring squares, as you can see here. This is a a peak of value, and this is a peak of value, and this is a pit that you want to avoid. Um, and so the optimal, you know, if, if a human or you know, a, a rational agent is put in this environment, uh, and let's say it starts um, here, then uh, you know, the optimal behavior, because we're slightly to the left of the, of the center here, the optimal behavior is to go directly to the left-hand peak of value and then stay there. Right. That's, that's the optimal solution for this environment. But, um, and then what I've shown here is, okay, if you see that behavior and you run IRL, right, then you will conclude this gray, what I, you know, this gray map shows the conclusion that the IRL algorithm draws about what is the value function underlying this behavior, okay? And in fact, the, there's, in the posterior over value functions, this is now, Whereas in, in truth, it's highly positive. It now looks slightly negative because the robot didn't go to the right. 
right? And therefore, that rules out the possibility that, that this is the highest value square, right? And then so the, the mean of the posterior is actually now slightly below zero, so to speak. Um, and it definitely didn't go down, so it's pretty sure that's not a good idea either, right? So you get the wrong conclusion from observing the behavior. Um, and in fact, if you solve the, if you solve, or you, actually this is one round of best response in the game, so it's not a complete uh, solution to the game. But the, the, after one round of best response, the, what the human does is actually to visit both of these regions of high value. And then this shows the posterior that the learning algorithm obtains, and it's much closer to the true posterior from, um, compared to that one. And so this is just a trivial ob observation that the solutions of these two-player games are different from uh, optimal behavior by one agent observed by a second agent that's trying to figure out the value. Okay. Um, so then looking, looking ahead, you know, beyond trivial toy examples, and say, okay, let's imagine if we take this seriously, right? We are actually going to need to figure out to a large extent what the human value function is. And uh, that's, you know, that's easily a 20, 30 year project. And it's interesting to think about, well, what's the output, right? It's like if, I, if, I, if you guys are a bunch of venture capitalists and I was here saying, hey, I need funding to, to start this. And then they can say, okay, so what are you gonna sell? At the end, well, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna sell value functions, right? What, well, what exactly is that gonna look like? You know, so just, you just try to imagine doing this, right? And taking it seriously and then think, okay, well, what are the sources of information? Um, well, actually, there are enor there's enormous amount of information about human behavior, right? So everything, pretty much everything that's ever been written by humans is actually about people doing things. Some of it very boring, like people buying two bushels of corn uh, and exchanging that for you know, some arrowheads. Uh, but even that is really useful information about the human value function. Um, and, you know, and novels and, and newspaper articles and everything else and every television program. You know, there's, there's not a lot of television programs where they only talk about rocks and not about, you know, nothing about what people uh, do or care about or any of those things. So, so almost everything out there is going to be useful information. A lot of it is, you know, in newspaper articles and novels and everything, it's it. one person does something, another person gets upset or happy, right? That's also useful information, but again, it's a form of behavior. It's not, it's not direct proof that one is wrong and the other one's right, but it's evidence uh, that can all be thrown into the mix uh, if it's understood properly. So, you know, so nat we, in order to do this, we'll need to do natural language understanding and. You know, computer vision to understand all the TV programs and what everyone's doing and speech and everything else. So there's, there's lots of AI to be done to make this work, but it's easier than building the super intelligent AI system that we are, are preparing for. Um, so it's, it's, it should be feasible, and so that this is, this is, this is good news. Um, it, we need to solve this actually much earlier. So this, this startup company, the Values R Us Corporation, uh, you know, we'll, we'll actually have customers fairly soon, I think. You know, so um, self-driving cars, domestic robots. Uh, you know, so one example I give, I don't think I have the slides here. I just gave a talk in Korea where I made a little sort of cartoon sequence of a robot uh, in the house, and then there's the little kids sitting there, and their plates are empty, and they're hungry, and then the robot has to find them something to eat, and the fridge is empty. Uh, oh, and there's a little cute kitty. And then the robot says, oh, yeah, we'll cook the kitty for dinner. Uh, and then there's a newspaper headline, and that's the end of the domestic robot industry. Um, so there's a very strong economic incentive for self-driving car companies and domestic robot companies and personal digital assistant companies, right? You know, if they're going to be helping you book your airline flights and, and making meetings, you know, you don't want them to make meetings with lunatics. You don't want them to book flights via Antarctica. Uh, and so on. So they'll need to understand your value system uh, fairly well. Um, so there's this very, very strong economic incentive to get it right, um, even fairly soon. So that's good. All right, that means that this should be this should be part of the AI industry, uh, and we will will be developing the technology 
um, for you know reasons that these are related reasons to the concern about superintelligent AI, um, but they're much more mundane. Uh, the the difficulties include um, you know the fact that the humans are complicated. Some of them are nasty. So how do you, you know, how do we avoid? You know, there's lots of bad behavior out there. Um, how do we avoid learning that we should be, you know, that the robot should be supporting all these very undesirable behaviors? Um, you know, even if it's not clear the extent to which our behavior can even be successfully described as 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 trying to optimize any value function, uh, there are lots of reasons for thinking that isn't. True, including the fact that evolution doesn't care about us as individuals anyway. Right? So a lot of evolutionary theory says, no, it's nothing to do with you and your desire to reproduce. It's actually you know, small groups of genes uh, that actually exist across multiple species. And they're the units of optimization. You know, they're the ones that are, that are really being selected. Uh, uh, and from a, even, you know, even if you think about the species as a unit, right? well, as as a unit, the, the species, if it's going to survive, needs to do both exploration and exploitation. Exploration means one way of having the species explore is by producing individuals who are completely nuts, right? who, who act in extremely risk-prone ways and then sort of you know, go off and explore, you know, sail across some ocean that they think is going to fall off the end of the earth and happen to arrive in another continent and things like that. You know, complete, completely nuts, the kind of stuff that they do on Star Trek. right? Uh, it's not that the individuals involved are irrational. It's, it's that the concept of rationality, in some senses, doesn't apply to individuals at all. Right? It's actually that they're just fulfilling a function which is part of the rationality of the species, or the tribe, or the, the gene group, or whatever. So, it, so things can get really, really complicated in understanding the, you know, if you, the, the full spectrum of human behavior and, and how we infer anything from it. Uh, you know, we're computationally limited, so if you watch two people playing chess, well, you know, one of them loses. Does that mean it's because they wanted to lose the game? Uh, or no, it's because, well, in fact, it's because they, you know, they're both computationally, lim computationally limited and one's maybe slightly more than the other. Uh, so All right, it could be that he's trying to lose. Yeah, it could be that he's trying <laughs> to lose. That, that does happen, but usually, <laughs> yeah, not too obviously, right? But, um, and so on. And then, of course, you know, we, there's different, you know, all humans are individuals, and then there's differences across cultures, and so on, and then, and there are these questions of trade-offs, right? That we, you know, even if you do learn the value function of of individuals, you can't optimize everyone's value function because there aren't enough countries to be king of or queen of, and uh, there isn't enough money for everyone to be a billionaire, and so on, so on, so on. So, right? so, so, how do you deal with those? And these these are age-old questions in social sciences. So we're not going to solve by observing the human behavior, but by making everything much more explicit and mathematical and empirical, uh, hopefully we can make a lot of progress. And maybe we'll learn more about uh, what, we, what we think we should be doing, and, and, and then that will make us better at doing it. Um, OK, so the consequences are various. Um, so the, the, the objective is, I think, in part to change how we think of the field uh, to include these considerations and, and, and then ensure that what we're, what we're building is actually the, produces behavior that we're happy with. Um, and uh, you know, as I said, there are a lot of questions that social scientists have studied for a long time. And th that will have to be incorporated. Some of those concepts will have to be incorporated. Um, and then the last question is, well, is a lot, when you actually get concrete and say, OK, we, 20 years' time, Values Are Us Corporation is now selling these things, you know, well, what are they going to look like? Right? It's not at all obvious. It's, I could do it for chess very easily. I could sell you a value function for chess, um, you know, and it says nine points for a queen and five points for a rook, and you know, it's pretty straightforward. Right? But that's because chess is fully observable. And there's no argument about whether you have a queen or not. Um, but the inputs to a domestic robot are you know, the, the video sequence coming in through its camera. You're not going to define value functions in terms of 
video sequences coming in through cameras, right? So, you know, gazillions of pixels, uh, that will be doffed, right? So what are you going to do? And that, that, I think, is a somewhat open question. Uh, and it's, it's, it, but, you know, a technically, technically important question to answer. Um, so coming back to Norbert Wiener, right? So he, in this paper, which I really do recommend reading, uh, you know, he points out that, that these questions are incredibly difficult. Uh, and, you know, and a scientist is sort of only seeing a very local part of a, an unending stream that goes on for millennia uh, and might think that what he's doing is beneficial, but in fact could be entirely wrong. And you have to look over a long time scale and try and figure out the answers, and it's very difficult. Um, but you have no choice but to try to do it. So I guess that's why you're all here. Thank you. It's just we have about five minutes for our questions, and then we can have a break for them. Sure. Let it give you <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So out of the like, different aspects of the value alignment problem, which, which of them do you think are likely to be solved for sub-intelligent systems? And which do you think are likely to remain that would not be as relevant for sub-intelligent systems, but would still be important for super-intelligent systems? That's a good question. I mean, I think the, the point I mentioned towards the end that value functions apply in these partially observable environments uh, and how do you define them, right? So you could imagine, let me just take something very simple like, you know, is the cat alive or dead, right? So you could put, you know, a higher value on the cat being alive than the cat being dead. Um, but for different Robots, the mapping from percept sequences to the probability that the cat is in fact alive or dead uh, would be different. And so presumably we all have to agree on what we mean by alive and dead and then the robot manufacturer has to have sort of recognizers for that. And this is all very hand wavy, but, um, and, uh, and then you supply the values for the alive and dead. The, and then the problem with that is that in fact, you know, alive and dead are not well defined you know, if you talk to anyone, you know, like a neurosurgeon who works in a hospital, it's extremely hard in many cases to figure out if someone's alive or dead. Um, and one of my colleagues told me that, uh, so the, the hospital allowed him to, to, to run experiments on people who had been officially declared dead. Uh, so he kept them alive on the ventilator, or kept, them, kept the bodies functioning on the ventilator, you know, kept them alive because they're already dead. Um, and two of them got, went, got up and went back to work. So, <laughs> uh, so this is actually, you know, it's a, it's a tricky thing. It's not really defined. And, and this is exactly with the superintelligence systems. This is, they find, the worry is they find the loopholes, right? They find ways of achieving what you specified as the objective that are so, you would just never imagine they would think about that. It's so extremely counterintuitive, but they, you know, just like tax law. Right, you think you've ruled out all the loopholes, but people find this completely bizarre way of, you know, they, they pay their employees with gold coins, right? Because uh, that's, you know, there it's a $5 gold coin, so, so that's $5, right? And I, I give you one each. Uh, and so you don't have to pay any tax because you're only making $5 a month. But, you know, <laughs> you know that, that's kind of an example, but, you know, they will come up with much, much, much more devious ways that, you know, and, and alive and dead, so people in, this, in the, existential risk literature talk precisely about uh, situations that you could argue are kind of in this gray zone of ill-definedness. Yes, you're still alive, but you're immobilized in a box with, with a heroin drip uh, and so on. And, and you might say, well, that's really, you might as well be dead. Um, but no, you're alive. You met the, you met the stated criteria. So, so there, I think, is, is where um, uh, where the question of um, having alignment, which is not perfect, right? So my one, you get sort of a clash of intuitions. If one says, look, if you're, if you're, the value function the robot is optimizing is within epsilon of the true value function, then nothing too bad can happen, right? And you can maybe prove that, you know, the most you can lose is, you know, epsilon squared over one minus gamma or something, right? Um, but then, uh, you know, your other intuition says, but if the robot is way, way, way smarter than you, you know, it can somehow use that epsilon to, 
as a loophole to, to produce something that in the long run you're extremely happy with, uh, unhappy with, I should say. Um, and uh, I don't, I mean, that, that seems like a question that can be attacked mathematically. Uh, I think it will come out the desire the right way, but I still, I'm still not sure about it. Uh, Thomas. So par partly, uh, these concepts like alive, uh, I would sort of think of them as these latent variables that are they're not fully identifiable. Yep. So, so like re the reward functions in inverse reinforcement learning are posited to exist, but they, but they are not directly observed. Yep. So, so we have all the challenges of latent variable model learning, which is that often you cannot pin down the exact value of these things. But still, they give a, the reason to use them is they give a very compact and maybe even approaching causal explanation yep. of, of the behavior. So it's, it, yeah, it will be yeah, tough. And so the, but that means the AI system needs to know that it doesn't know, which kind of get, coming back to your very first slide, um, and needs to be, to behave robustly with respect to that. Uh, yeah, but I think I, 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 I almost want to put on my Lotfi Zade accent uh -huh. and say, I mean, the, it's not just that we can't observe alive and dead directly, but in fact, it isn't a well-defined, right? right? Yes. We, it, that even, even notionally, you can't say, okay, here is, a, here is a particular world, and alive is true, and here's another one where alive is false. Right, right? But one that way, every, so there's one always way, a dichotomy. Right. Approaching that yeah. within probability theory is to say that I don't know the exact definition of alive. I have a distribution over a possible definition. Right, so, so and that, I that yeah. And I cannot identify uniquely. The evidence is not strong enough to tell me. Yeah, but is, is that uncertainty treated the same way? In other words, you, do you take expectations over it, or do you, well, I would probably do you take wor worst it, case over it? Yeah, and it. that's one way of thinking. Um, I mean, of course, the other yeah. response is, is, the, is adversarial debugging. That we, yeah, we mm -hmm. apply another AI system to the first one and try to find those corner cases and then check to see the people like, so what do you think about this, uh, yeah, this what if? more being driven setting? Uh, does that look good to you? Yeah. <clears throat> so have you thought about um, going meta in the cooperative IRL? So you, there's, there's still a particular agent, which is the human, which is this well-defined thing. And in the real world, there's this sort of like uncertainty. I mean, this relates to alive versus dead. Like, what, what counts as human and what human actions? Do you think that would change the math? So what counts as human? You, you, are you... It's, it's not that I have two arms and two legs and um, um, feathers for... by hat. Exactly. Yes. So, so what what counts as what you care about? Yes. Yeah. No, not what oh. counts as what I care about. What counts as a human? The, the A is trying to maximize the human's value function. It needs to know. So the value feedback agents. Yes, exactly. Oh. Um... I would expect the math to be abstract. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's a political question. You know, should we include in our observations the, you know, the behavior of the clinically insane? Uh, you know, and what you know, what about animals and so on? I, I I'm not sure that it's more a question of when you have, when you add that uncertainty to the model, what does it do to the math? And if AI can construct things that count as human under its definition and, uh, exactly. and model their preferences more easily. There you go. That gets back to Victoria's point. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I do. I don't know whether we will have to be microchipped at birth so that the system knows that we we we, we count as real and and these are non fakeable uh, microchips. But yeah, and so yeah, I don't know. I maybe we need to make sure it doesn't ever make people. Uh, this sounds like a like a super intelligent problem, and not a sub intelligent problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, so uh, that's just last last question. Okay. So is there a way once the uh, AI system has learned in some way the value function by looking at videos, reading text, whatever you know, whatever human behavior and so on? How would you check that they learned? It has learned the right value function. So funny you should ask. I was just thinking about that last night. Is sort of imagining a large library of decision-making scenarios, uh, which would be represented presumably by you know, an, Im uh, an embedded 3D virtual reality experience that would go on for some time. And then the robot would have to be, we, 
deciding how to behave in this in this scenario, and we could, you know, sort of kind of like a driving test, right? So at least, you know, you you've got a hundred thousand scenarios where you're sure that across all these it's behaving uh, adequately well, then, and that would be a, that would be a good start for a domestic robot, I think, yeah, the testing and for a self-driving car. Uh, as well. something like that, then why don't you use that? You know the answer at every scenario, you know the right answer and the wrong decision. And why don't you use that to give the value capture to, in the first place to the AI? System? Oh, because we're not, right, that assumes that we, the human, can induce from these hundred thousand scenarios what exactly the value function is. And so we, we can largely, uh, the assumption is that we can largely act in a morally and yeah. uh, societally reasonable way in a large variety of settings, but we're unable to make explicit in a reliable way exactly what the value yeah, function is that we're, approach, we're using. Like whether the AI system has the right value, has learned the right value function, and passing that test is enough for you to say, Yes, he has, he has learned the right value function. Then, also a system where I teach exactly. But I mean, think, think about the, 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 think about the, the image net competition, right? I can recognize all these objects. Yeah. I can have a system that learns by any mechanism how to recognize objects, and I can test it on you know, a million test cases, but I can't write down the discriminating function, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's just like that. I think the question is like, could I use those as training? Like, if I have these hundred thousand examples and I think that those are accurate, you might then say, well, let's just throw those in as the training data, which suffices to train some model that will at least. Pass yeah, sure. Them. I mean, that's that's one way of of doing it, and in some sense, that's precisely. Except that I'm looking at training data which is occurring naturally, right? Yeah. The actual behavior of the human race, where I haven't validated. Uh, that everyone is behaving precisely according to the values that I want the robot to learn. Um, but you still have to be able to learn from that, that kind of data, right? So, so King Midas did what he did, and then he's expressing remorse. Well, you can learn from that behavior sequence something about human values, that they, they like gold, but they actually like their daughter even more than gold. Uh, but they're also that they're not 100% rational in predicting the outcomes of their choices, right? That's all good information, even though none of it is optimal behavior. In the danger of like reconstructing the uh, value function just from those training examples, is that similarly to how for like uh, evolutional networks, danger dimension that you can have like adversarial examples, which like you know, looks sort of just like one of the original images, but it is totally misclassified. Like, so near, yeah, what we used to call near miss examples in the machine learning literature before it was entirely forgotten and replaced with a new machine learning literature. Um, but yeah, yeah, so Niamis, I mean, the, the, these, are, these are all good cases, and, and you, could, you could look at fables and, and other instructive stories for children as precisely uh, doing that for human beings. All right, um, so let, let's thank Professor Russell again. Uh, thank you.